There is evidence that more disagreeable people are more likely to be successful as managers. Now, why? Well, Baudreau, who wrote a paper called Effects of Personality on Executive Career Success, said the following. Agreeableness associates with being trusting, submissive, and compliant, which could be perceived as naivete, docility, and a tendency to follow rather than lead. All right, so that's his opinion. But then, here's what he measured. So these are... Effects of big five traits on career success. Now, you know, career success can obviously be defined a number of ways. It could be career satisfaction, or it could be like external markers of career success. And, and they did both. So we're going to look at direct, because that's the, the external sort of objective markers. What you see is that if you're high in neuroticism, that's not so good for how much money you make. There's a negative correlation of, of 0.3, which, by the way, that's a big correlation. So... You know, you'll hear people say that 0.5 is a large correlation and 0.3 is moderate and, you know, 0.2 is small. And that's wrong. And that, that was clarified four or five years ago. Um, I'll get the paper for you. I can't remember it. It was an American psychologist. But the guy who wrote the paper, what he did was he looked at a whole bunch of social science studies and then calculated how frequently different effect sizes showed up. And what he found was that 0.5 was unbelievably large. You know, that 5% of social science studies ever got a correlation of 0.5. It's like, if you get a correlation of 0.5 in your study, you've either made a dramatic error, or you've replicated something that's already well known, or, you know, you're in science, because it never happens. 0.3, that's a pretty good correlation. So, so the fact that neuroticism is negatively correlated with how much money you make, how likely you are to ascend, and then how close you are to being CEO. Obviously, the effect size decrease. So, um, neuroticism is also, or so, sorry, extroversion is a reasonable predictor only of how much you're ascending, and it's pretty small. Um, openness has a correlation with how much money you make, but that's probably because openness is highly associated with intelligence. And so, openness is not a good marker for intelligence, IQ tests are much better markers, so that's an attenuated relationship. But then you look at agreeableness. It's negative 0.32 in total, negative 0.24 for direct in terms of how much money you make. So, you know, that's an interesting thing because one of the things that determines how much money you make is how willing you are to say no. Right? Because if you're negotiating with someone, then the only thing you have at your back is your ability to say no and to push it, or even to ask for a raise. And, you know, pushy people are much more likely to ask for a raise. And, of course, those who ask for a raise are much more likely to get it. So the guys who are hard to get along with, because most of the people who are hard to get along with are guys, are more likely to be paid more. They're more likely to ascend the corporate ladder. They're more likely to be close to the CEO in terms of proximity. And uh, they're even more likely to be rated as employable. It's funny, eh? Because you'd think that, you know, if you're agreeable and easy to get along with and all that, that people would be more likely to rate you as a suitable employee, but that isn't right. That's the, the opposite seems to happen. So, disagreeable extroverts are narcissists, and there's some evidence that you can derive from this data, you know, because there's always this talk about disagreeable extroverts or narcissists being more likely to rise up to CEO level, and you know, there is some evidence for that, at least insofar as agreeableness is a negative predictor of doing such. Alright, so, so one of the things we've just found is that one of the predictors for ascendancy and proximity to a high status position is low agreeableness. Now, the next thing you might think about is, well, what, what role does that play in terms of the factors that men and women find attractive in each other? So, you might say, well, what do you want in a mate? If you're a woman, you might say, well, you know, you want someone who's kind and loving and forgiving and empathic. And those are all good things. But, but it isn't necessarily the case that the empirical studies show that that's what drives mate selection. So we could look. This is an interesting study. So it's a few years old. 1,000 French-Canadian respondents. 433 males and 700 females. And so here, here are the variables. One is possession of resources. It's a composite index composed of occupational prestige, income, and education. And then 
The other variable is acquisition of partners, sexual partners, that is Number of lifetime and preceding year sexual partners Lifetime occurrence of simultaneous partners, which is a yes or no variable And lifetime frequency of simultaneous partners, one to five, with five being very often Here's the assumption, you can you know, decide for yourself if you think this is a warranted assumption The number of partners a member of sex A acquires is taken as an index of how often this individual is chosen by sex B So that's an indication of re reproductive fitness, desirability At least as assessed by members of the opposite sex Who you would think would be the logical judges for that sort of thing Male criteria 166 unattached women ages 25 to 50 Correlation between fertility rates and number of partners in previous year equals 0.94 Males choose fertility, indicators, beauty, waist to hip ratio, youthful appearance, and neotenous facial features Neotenous means there's a tendency among animals as they evolve to increasingly look more in their adult stages like their juvenile forms So if, here's, here's an example, if, if you look at the skull of a baby chimpanzee, it looks almost exactly like the skull of an adult human so what's happened is we've, as adults, we're more like baby chimpanzees than, than the adult chimpanzees are We've, we've, we've what, maintained a lot of our juvenile characteristics Playfulness, you know, the ability to continue to learn, plasticity, all those things um, There's a preference in objective beauty analysis, say, of facial features for men to prefer more neotenous female faces so, and you can tell that if you look at pictures of models They generally have relatively small noses, relatively big eyes The sort of things that are associated with cute And cute actually is a pretty, a pretty identifiable category Most of the things that people find cute have large eyes And relatively, the rest of their facial features are relatively small There's other things that are associated with cute that aren't necessarily associated with you know, sexual attractiveness, because cute things also have sort of random movements, like baby-like movements And so, the things that people, and you know, relatively short arms, and just think of a teddy bear So anyways, those are the male, those are the male criteria Agreeableness is one of the five dimensions of the big five, we all know that And it can be broken down into these two aspects, compassion and politeness And so you can kind of figure out how agreeable you are by looking at these items They're all positively scored for the sake of simplicity So, if you intensely feel others' emotions If you're always inquiring about how others are doing And you actually care, rather than doing it for the sake of show If, you, if you're capable of sympathizing with other people If you respect authority If you don't like to seem or be pushy And you don't like to impose your will on others Then you're an agreeable person and a disagreeable person or an antagonistic person, obviously, is the opposite of that So, they don't feel people's emotions very um, profoundly They're not really all that concerned, automatically, about how other people are feeling And they're not that sympathetic um, It's funny, because in my clinical practice, I can tell the difference between the agreeable people and the non-agreeable people Because when the agreeable people come and they have a cup of coffee, they always bring me one but when the disagreeable people show up and have a cup of coffee, they only bring a cup of coffee for themselves So, it's quite comical, actually So, now you might think that, you know, because our, 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 what would you say? Our society is, at the moment, tilted towards regarding agreeableness as a virtue You know, because you should be kind and you should be empathetic and you should be compassionate and all those sorts of things But, our research, this isn't published yet because it's complicated to, to communicate, and we haven't figured out how to do it yet But what we've found is that if you push any of the um, traits too far, they fall off a cliff, fundamentally So if you get too agreeable, then you're dependent, and you can't make decisions, and so on And maybe you're kind of a Freudian Oedipal mother, too, right? You're so, you're so uh, concerned with your, with your child's well-being that you can't, you're not harsh enough to send them outside or, or make them do anything they don't want to do because it might upset them and so that's not so good, and then if you're too disagreeable, well, I already said what that was like If you take antisocial people who are in prison, you know, they're, they're aggressive and violent And, you know, the criminal types and their, their predatory are 
low in agreeableness, so you can see how that's a bad thing. But then, in the middle range, it, it gets more complicated, because then agreeableness, that where you're located on the normal distribution, how good that is depends, to some degree, on what it is that you are going to do. So, one of the ways to think about how to maximize your success in life is to attempt to match your personality to the environment. You know, you might think that if how you raised your children mattered, then children who were raised well would be more similar than children who were raised badly, because that would reflect the effect of your parenting, right? So, you've done a good job as a parent, so your children are more similar, whereas someone who just ignored them, those children are different. But that's actually the opposite of what happens, is that the children that are neglected are more similar, and the children who are attended to well are more different. And the reason for that, I think, is the same reason that we see more pronounced differences in egalitarian societies, which is, if you care for your children, it means that you make a very individual relationship with each of them. So you're not necessarily using the same strategies for each child, unless you think of them as meta-strategies. And like, a meta-strategy might be, well, I get to know you, and I get to know you, and because you're different people, I react differently to you. And what's, what constitutes my philosophy of parenting would be, act differently towards the children's differences. And so, maybe if you're particularly good at that, your children turn out maximally different from one another. And that's because you're allowing their genetic differences to manifest themselves. You're not oppressing them, you know, and trying to cram them into the little box that you think that they should fit in. Now, the downside of that is that you're going to get differences, you know, and some of them might be quite surprising to you. 